Well, let's get right into it now with our guest tonight. Isis Aquarian is probably best known as a member of the Source family, a group of beautiful white-clad hippies living in the Hollywood Hills during the 1970s. <coughs> Excuse me. They follow the teachings of a man named Jim Baker, a reformed bank robber and judo-chopping killer who fronted a psych cult band, served salads to the stars, took 14 wives, and eventually threw himself from a cliff and a hang glider. And we're going to get the whole story about all that and more with our guest tonight, Isis Aquarian. Good evening, Isis. How are you? Hi, Jim. It's great Thank to you. have you here. Thank you for joining us tonight. So... I, I mean, let's let's start a little bit off with, you know, what, how would you describe the Source family? Because I, there's a lot of words that I see, you know, online thrown around to describe the Source family. How would you describe them in your words? Well, I have my own reality, of course. Even some of your interpretations, I was going, what? <laughs> he threw, threw himself off a cliff. I was, I, was just, I was just reading from an article. <laughs> I know, that's what I mean. But so I just, you know, I have my own reality within it, and which works for me and works for me. And I totally understand that there, everybody has their own take on it. Even the family members, we don't all have the same take on it. So um, you mentioned four four o'clock in the morning. Uh, that's when we used to get up. Uh, actually, most spiritual groups, the yogis, or most mystery school teachings or, or spiritual groups, do get up at that time in the morning where, where it's clear. There's no thought projections. Most people are asleep. And it's called the uh, sending currents. It's, it's the monks, the Buddhas, they all, that was their time. So I kind of had a little laugh about that. So it's not just bacon and eggs at that time. <laughs> no. It's spiritual bacon and eggs if it's <laughs> done at that time. <laughs> oh, gosh. But, um, well, um, where do you want me to start? Well, I mean, it's, it's always good to, to start at the beginning. Uh, you know, kind of describe to us what your life was uh, before you came to the Source family. Well, for Okay. I believe, first of all, I, I really, really, really believe that um, we all, in, in reincarnation, and I believe we all agreed to incarnate this lifetime, and I also believe we agreed to certain destinies. I, I think we made certain agreements, and um, I, I just, it never fell in place, basically, until I came to Father uh, Yod in the source, and I really understood that. But before that, <clears throat> I grew up in a military family. My dad was chief of documentations, and I was the oldest of seven children, and we traveled a lot. Now, my dad, being chief of documentations in the Air Force, he was the one that went to Area 51. He was the one that documented things when they needed to be documented, even though I could never really get him to talk about it. He was also in the CIA. So that's, it was a very interesting upbringing, to say the least. Um, I grew up being archived and photographed um, because there was always cameras around. So that was my main thing that I took with me when I entered the source family was the archiving and cameras, and that's why we've got them. But before that, um, I worked in the White House under Johnson. I was a social uh, White House aide, and then I went to New York and worked for Brown of Airlines and hung out with kind of a, in society in both places. But I started hearing about the uh, flower children and the hippies and and everything that was going on in L.A., and it totally intrigued me. And uh, I just gave up everything and moved to L.A. one day, and um, that started my journey. Uh, I met Jim Baker uh, before the source. He uh, <clears throat> had the Old World Restaurant, which was a very famous restaurant on Sunset Strip, he ended up with three famous restaurants on Sunset Strip. But 
Jim Baker was a Hollywood legend within his time as Jim Baker, even before the source. So I met him when he it was at the old world, but we, you know, kind of both went our ways. And I was living with a famous rock and roll photographer, Ron Rosselli, and we were doing um, all the bands. We were doing the posters and album covers for all the bands at the time. And we were doing a poster called Jesus Christ Superstar, and he said, I, I need uh, models. I need, like, people with long hair that look like Jesus. And I said, well, my friend Jim Baker opened up this vegetarian restaurant on Sunset called The Source. I hadn't seen Jim in a while, and I said, I'll go down, and they're all running around like a bunch of little Jesuses. It'll be perfect. You know, they were wearing robes, and they had long hair and beards. And so I went down, and I stepped up on the patio, and <clears throat> he comes out, but he was looking like Moses. I mean, he was no longer Jim Baker. And, Tim, something in that moment just really shifted for me, and it was like I knew that that was my agreement right there. And I just turned around and walked out on everything. I thought Ron was going to come with me, but he he said, no way. And uh, so I left. I just left everything and um, joined Father Yod and the family. So this wasn't a... a and, I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, this wasn't a situation where, you know, where somebody was, you know, trying to, to get you to join something. This was a situation no. where, where you <laughs> felt it from within you. Yeah. I would, yeah, I mean, it was like, I was giving up a lot to do what I did. I mean, I was, like, uh, had a very good life, a very in life, a very good life. And, um, yeah, there was nothing wrong with my life at that moment. Um, so it was just, it was destiny. You know, everybody's got a legacy. Everybody's got a destiny. And that absolutely clicked in for me. And that whole time period of the 60s and 70s to begin with was like a time out of time. That was a whole, it was like a reset, a form of a, like what's happening now. It's like a whole new world's happening, a whole new reset for this whole planet and all of mankind. Well, we had a mini one in the 60s and 70s. It was like a portal open and many of us walked through it. And we existed for a period of time in what I call time out of time. It was called timeline jumping. And um, we, be we became the forerunners of so much that's happening now. That You know, the home birth, the breath, breath, uh, breastfeeding. You couldn't even have a baby at home. That was illegal. You could have been arrested. I mean, people don't realize just 40, 50 years ago, how really crazy it was with things like that. You couldn't homeschool kids. So we were homeschooling kids. We were having home births. We were, uh, you know, one of the most famous vegetarian restaurants to hit mainstream was the source right on Sunset uh, Boulevard. And everybody came, all the musicians, all the actors, all the movers and shakers. Um, you know, they loved it. So it was a, a very iconic time, not only for us, for, for many, many people. It's when the, the yogis came over and the Eastern religion hit with their, their wisdom, their spiritual wisdom. And we basically were all like babies back then. We were like in kindergarten in this school of life. And uh, we needed a little bit of guidance. So the gurus came and the masters and... Jim Baker was a disciple of Yogi Bhajan until he realized that he had to take it higher than what the Eastern religion was bringing, and he wanted East to meet West, and so he formed his own communal group, and he, did, he says, I'm not a master, I'm not a guru, he says, I'm going to be the father, a father figure, and so we called him Father Yod. Well, let's let's go back a little bit to before you you went out there and back when you were you know living kind of your previous life. Uh, you were you know certainly getting 
the most out of life uh, from from the surface. You know, anybody looking at the life you were living would say, wow, here's somebody who has, you know, quite... Oh, my God. <laughs> I mean, you're hanging yeah. out with famous people. You're you're in important circles. Uh, you're seeing yep. the world with Braniff. I mean, what... Uh, yeah. I mean, describe to us just a little bit of what that life was like, but also what you were feeling during it. Well, I, it was just, I don't know what I was feeling. It was just, it was what it was. It was just normal. You know, it, um, I had been brought up somewhat privileged, even though we were a dysfunctional family, which so many families were back then. I mean, you know, my dad became an alcoholic and, you know, what comes with that. My mom was a saint, so that saved the whole situation. And, and who, who grows up with, you know, seven kids, six brothers and sisters? I mean... You know, that in itself is a whole story, but I left, so I left home. My my dad, we were living in Florida when I graduated from high school. My dad was working at Cape Canaveral on the, on one of the shuttle programs. And so, I mean, you know, I used to go out and be able to go into the, you know, restricted areas and stuff like that. And, and, and um, I, my senator of Florida um, had a job opening in D.C., and so that's, I, I went to D.C. to work for my senator and uh, Senator Gurney, and I ended up getting in with Lucy Johnson and that little crowd there, and President Johnson was the president, and I ended up getting a job as a social ho- uh, uh, White House social aide. So, you know, I was just, and I was put in that mix right away, and, um, you know, if I had stayed there, I would have married a politician and I would have been a socialite and probably an alcoholic and everything else that comes with it. And thank God that I had some kind of a divine guidance that just kept moving me out of situations so I didn't get stuck in any of them because I just went, you know, I, I think there's more than this. I, I, this isn't it. And I moved to New York because, you know, D.C. and New York are so close. You go back and forth anyhow. Mm -hmm. And I started getting in with the little crowd in New York, you know, Salvador Dali, a little bit of Andy Warhol. I never got, you know, to the factory group or anything. But, you know, I was at parties with them and, and that crowd and other people and, I started dating uh, one of the heirs to uh, Seagram's, uh, what is that, gin or whatever that is. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I had this whole New York thing happening. and then, But New York was just, it was dark. It was New York. It was, you know, it was, and I started hearing about L.A. and the sunshine and the ocean and and clean air and these people dropping out and wearing flowers in their hair. And I was going, God. And I started taking trips because I was uh, working for Brown and I could fly anywhere free. And I started coming to L.A. And I ended up meeting, you know, a young Rob Reiner and Richard Dreyfus, And I was actually dating Rob Reiner for a while there and decided to, to move out to L.A., you know, I just, I went, wow, how do you, how do you beat this? And so I did. But it was you know, still, it was still kind of that, that jet set lifestyle though, when you came out here, right? I mean, I mean, yeah, no. yep, yep, it was, but it was, it was a different frequency. It was a, it was a really, LA, I don't know, I, I, LA holds its own frequency. It held, it, it, it holds it. That's why. You go back hundreds of years, and L.A. has been a hub of a spiritual renaissance for a very long time. And uh, there's just something that happens there, and it was felt really, really good. So, yeah, I hit L.A., and then, uh, like I said, I met Jim Baker and his wife, Dora, at the time. And actually, I became really good friends with his wife, Dora, who was a... French girl, and um, loved Jim Baker. I thought he was absolutely awesome. You know, uh, he was 
what I call the ultimate man-man. You know, he was really a man's man and a woman's man. He was just, you know, he was awesome. Hollywood loved him, you know. And um, then I moved on to some other circles and ended up with uh, Ron. And then we had that, you know, that whole segue into the music and all the musicians and and stuff like that. So, yeah, it never, kind of really never ended for me. I always kind of rode that I mean, crest that, of the wave. That was uh, that was quite the musical scene at that time. What, what, what Who were some oh, of the artists that you, you were hanging out with? It was the with? best. It was the best. It was, it was like, uh, uh, it was like a, a new age troubadour experience where it was just so spontaneous and so from the heart and so loving. And then, of course, the more the drugs got involved, the more, uh, you know, a lot of craziness started happening within it. But it was really pure, Jim. It it started out really pure, and it was very intuitive. It was very psychic. It was very spiritual, really, with everybody. And it was the best music ever. You know, it was just, uh, 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 it was a renaissance happening, and um, it was just it was really hard to explain. And and back in that day, you could do, go anywhere and do anything. You could be walking up in Laurel Canyon, and somebody's door would be opening, and there'd be you could look through the door and see that there was a party happening. You could just go up and walk in. Oh, wow. Seriously. And then it would be Joni Mitchell at the piano, because I've done that once. <laughs> you know, I was walking down Laurel Canyon, and I heard this party going, and I looked over, and there's this house, and the doors open, there's all these people, and I just walked over and walked in, and, you know, there's Joni Mitchell at the, at the piano, playing the piano, and, and it was just like, it was very, very um, time out of time again, mm-hmm. <laughs> very special and um yeah well we're we're going to take our first break here and when we come back on the other side i want to get in uh, more into father yoden we'll talk about kind of some of his background as well uh, a reminder to everybody out there that during the program if you have any questions you would like to submit uh, then you can send them to me tim at midnight.fm you can also post them in the midnight society facebook group tracy has the the show thread pinned to the top of the group as she does each night thank you tracy you can also put them on twitter using the hashtag midnight fm or you can put them in the discord server if you are a member of midnight fm at the insider or elite levels there when you go and you sign up you'll be able to get access to the discord server and in that server you will find different channels for the programs here and there's a midnight society channel so you can just go in there and put in your questions and sometimes if folks are hanging out in there there's always some conversation going on there as well it's worth checking out if you're a member you know and and uh, have access to it and of course you know the best way to hang out and uh, be here and be part of the Midnight Society is by hanging out with us while we are broadcasting live. So there's all those different methods in order to do it, and uh, we appreciate all of you who do so. And we also like it when you listen after the fact, too, but, you know, it's we're going to be talking about the Source family tonight, and we're a family here with Midnight Society. So we'll take a quick break and then back with more here on Midnight Good FM. Morning. Talking about the Source family and Father Yod, and before we get too far deeply into father yod let's let's start off isis with who he was before he became the father and you know we were talking about a little bit about his life as jim baker but like you he was he was not a california native he was drawn there right he um was from ohio actually and um he had he had quite a a backstory his his life ran kind of the same timeline. Um, He wasn't as privileged as a child. He didn't have a father. And his uh, mother uh, had worked in the... uh, Even though she was white, she had worked in the cotton fields. And then she did um, house cleaning uh, for prestigious schools. So they used to live, like, in the basement of high society type of thing while she worked. So he got exposed to the finer, higher things of life 
that weren't necessarily his at the time. But um, he grew up, he was very well taken care of, and growing, once he became a young man, uh, he, it was, I think it was called a CCC by Roosevelt, who sent these young kids out to work, and um, he was, I can't remember what he, what was the name of it, the Conservation Corps, I think, and he would go out and work with the lumberjacks and cut down lumber and trees, and and he became very strong, and he be, and he grew up very fast. You know, he became became a man very fast, as a lot of those, uh, you know, the boys did back in in the the, the pre war and the war time. Um, from there, he 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 just he held many titles. Uh, he was an archery champion. He was a, a a swimming champion. He was a judo master. He actually joined the Marines and taught the elite Marine Raiders. For anybody who knows what the Marine Raiders are, they're like, you know, the elite of the Marines, and he taught them judo. And so this was just kind of who he was as he went through his life. Uh, he, at a very early age, he met uh, Jacqueline and Paul Braggs. I don't know if you know who they are. I, I know Jacqueline, sure. Yeah, and they became, like, very best friends. And so there was, and Paul Braggs has, like, uh, uh, the Braggs products, the vinegar and the... Oh, okay. Yeah, the Braggs. <laughs> but anyhow... Um, so they had this little thing going, and they were all very much into being uh, spiritual, clean living, somewhat vegetarian, um, health orientated, and they all converged in L.A. And um, Jim had tried out for a movie. He was a stuntman, and he tried out for a, a Tarzan movie, and that actually was one of the things that brought him to L.A., and he didn't get it, but he, again, like I, loved L.A. He knew that something was happening there, and he stayed. He ended up becoming a sandal maker up in Topanga Canyon. He married uh, a woman who was in the music of uh, the movie industry also. Her name was Elaine Baker, and they had three boys. And... um he, they both opened the Aware Inn on Sunset Boulevard, which is, was a very in famous restaurant. They were the first organic uh, restaurant, but they served meat, but it was organic and clean. And then um, they, they, Jim Baker was he definitely was a ladies' man. He, I could say, he wasn't very faithful. And he ended up uh, causing some problems, and him and Elaine ended up separating, and they had just opened their second restaurant down the street from the Aware Inn called The Old World, which, again, was very, 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 very famous. So they split, and um, he ended up with this French girl, Dora, and... That's when I met him, and then he went on to be a disciple of Yogi Bhajan's and was being groomed by Yogi Bhajan. I don't know if you know who Yogi Bhajan is. Well, let's give the audience a little bit of a background on him. Okay, Yogi Bhajan was one of the more famous yogis that came to L.A. He pretty much was the dominant yogi for the L.A. area, for the California area, and... Um, he was actually training Jim Baker to open up an ashram and be his, you know, right hand until Jim got disillusioned because he saw that, you know, there was some, there was some shadow side that was underbelly to a lot of stuff that was happening. And that's not what he saw his um, destiny to be. He knew there was something a little bit higher, more in tune for the age of Aquarius. He loved all these hippies and flower kids that were dropping out and their concepts and their thoughts and where, where that was going. 
more so than a 2,000-year-old program, you know, from India with the yogi. He, he saw that going a little bit higher. So um, he did. He left the yogi, and he formed his own commune, his own family called the Source Brotherhood, the Source Family. And we ran the Source Restaurant on Sunset and lived in a mansion in the Hollywood Hills, had our own life happening. We were on a absolutely total uh, spiritual quest. We were a mystery school teaching. We, we investigated everything, and he had, before he opened the source, there was a Theosophical Research Society with Manly P. Hall. There was the Blavatsky, Mabel Collins, the Vedanta. He was a Vedanta monk for six months. And, uh, you know, Islamic, Jewish, all of it, and uh, gave it to us. Those were our classes in the morning, morning meditation classes. Uh, American Indians, we, we, we started recognizing all incarnations from the past, bringing them to the future, respecting them, and then moving on, knowing that this was a whole new, this was a whole new time frame. So, I mean, how was that, how was that presented in his teachings? Was it a matter of, well, I mean, first of all, we should probably talk a little bit about, you know, you, you talked about who he worked with and who he studied under, but was he was he learning all of this because he wasn't finding what he was looking for or what it or was it that what he was looking for was to amass as much of this knowledge as he could? Both. Absolutely both. So he's, he's, yeah. he's collecting he was getting himself up to speed in this incarnation to, 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 to go forth and do what he felt his calling was because in a way i mean you know the the skeptical person for example could look at this and say well what what you can do in that situation is you can learn how to cherry pick the little bits out of all of these belief systems that will then attract followers and keep them in because you'll know what yep. to dangle to them but it sounds like and, from that's, the way yep. it, it, yep. and that's exactly what happened but it was done in an honest way. He told us exactly that that's, you know, that that's what happened to him, and that's what he was giving to us. But what he wanted from us is the same thing that he did with it. He went further with it. It all just became a foundation for him to spring from. And he was he became very intuitive. We all lived the sixties and seventies where everybody was intuitive. My God, you know. And that's how we were able to grasp uh, this vast amount of spiritual knowledge and information that was hitting. And it wasn't just us. It was a a lot of that um, humanity at that time was receiving this spiritual precipitation to, to find out and to go further and to figure it out. It was like a whole new program. And it was an evolutionary process, and we all knew that we were evolving out of something that was an old program that was no longer working. Our parents' generation with alcohol and and their negativity and their thought patterns and their just coming out of the war years, that was no longer working for a new start, for a new generation especially for a generation that had dropped out and left everything to start new. And that newness that grabbed them was spiritual tidbits in any way that we could get them. And then you make them your own. You make them your own, and that's exactly what we did. Uh, The thing about Father Yod was it wasn't just what he thought and said. He opened it to all of us. He expected all of us to have input. And that's what we did in morning meditations. We all had a voice. We all could contribute. Uh, Many visions came through other people that they shared it, you know, and then we would take it from there. It didn't all just come from Father Yod, 
you know. It was our training ground also. So it sounds so like... It, you, Go ahead. It's, it sounds like, you know, that you were all able to, you know, do what the best part of somebody who would survey a variety of belief systems would do, and that's to be able to see all of the different modalities of the same belief, that you can boil it down to what it all means, no matter what name you put on it, and you can exactly. look at the real truth behind it, and then you know, be able to just worry about that real truth and not get caught up in all the dogmatic principles, uh, you know, with, exactly. with whatever name you want to put on it. Yep, exactly. And it also taught us that we, it basically all was the same. What Buddha was teaching is the same thing Jesus was teaching, the same thing uh, Muhammad taught, the same thing that any of them taught in their own way, in their own language, in their, you know, their own uh, uh, terminologies, it all boiled down to saying the same thing, and that we really are all one humanity on this planet. You know, it that's what it was boiling down to, to get us to see that. And, and you know, we, we're all on our own path, and we're all in our own grade level, and that doesn't make somebody else's path or, or beliefs wrong. Or right, it, and it doesn't make what we believe wrong or right. It's it's that's for us, for our journey. Everybody's on their own journey, and we're not all on the same grade level. You know, you don't give somebody a high school course if you're in second grade. They they, they kind of have to go in stages, and that's what I meant when I said we were we just start. We were like babies. We were in kindergarten, and that's where the the eastern teachings came in because they they had the spiritual teachings you know and um and in any book we could find uh manly p hall's book um i'm blanking out here the sacred science of being was like a bible to us the secret teachings of all ages by manly p hall it has everything in there and and graphics and photos and drawings which any book that has drawings and graphics i'm i'm like yes <laughs> you know it's just it, it was it was there was enough out there for us to take to take it even higher than than what the 1920s we were finding from people that had had started this in the 1920s and Blavatsky in the late 1800s and so, um, yeah, it was, and new stuff came to us, you know. There, the whole theory about the age of Aquarius dawning is, you know, it, it has to be looked at, uh, the cycles, the, the, the astrological cycles and the planets and all of that. He told us back then, my God, he said there's going to be like, there's two more planets than the ones we even know about the planets. And, it, and we gave names to them, and we honored two more planets back in the 60s and 70s that weren't even discovered until the 80s and 90s, you know? And um, that was just our life, and it, it didn't become weird. It just became... But, of course, we used to stand on the hillside in L.A. in the Hollywood Hills, and we he would point them out to us. We could see, There was flying objects all over the sky at night, we used to sit there and watch UFOs. We never encountered them. Uh, he, he said they come in all forms and sizes, from 2 feet to 19 feet, and they all have their own agenda. They're from different star systems, just like he said people on Earth have. If, you, if somebody came to Earth and encountered different cultures, countries, nationalities, tribes, they're all different. You know, and he says it's the same with them. He said, some have a, a shadow agenda and some of our don't, you know? I, but I think part of, you know, part of the learning process would be that you have to, you have to be willing to be and, and be open to be having it be either way, that you have to kind of fumble through to some degree to find your, I mean, no spiritual quest can be, uh, can be easy. No, it wasn't. You you have to go through the fire. I loved that scene in Games of Thrones. Uh, so yeah, that, the Game of Thrones. That's it. Yeah, where she went into the fire and came out completely nude with 
three dragons on her shoulder. You know, I don't know if you've ever seen that scene. But it's like you get the, the, the fire burns away the dross within a person. So a, when you go through a spiritual quest, you go through a certain, um, it's called an etheric fire, and it just, you know, burns away all of the old crap and dross. And that's what happens when you, when people took acid or people that are taking ayahuasca now, they go through that refinement of, um, of, of the dross being burned away by the spiritual fire that purges you, and all that's left is the gold of self, you know, the true self. I don't know if I'm explaining this right, but... Oh, I think so. Um, yeah. So that was our journey, and every morning was different. We did... We lived so in the now that we never knew from day to day what was going to come down or happen. It was a whole new day, and something always did. It was always changing and and uh, something new. And and th- and then I I came in with uh, because I was at a studio filming rock stars. I had cameras. So when I came into the family, I bought I brought my camera because I started uh, documenting. I saw that just visually it was such eye candy to see these beautiful, beautiful people, uh, just with their their the pureness. They were just glowing with uh, with a light, and I went, my God, I have got, I've got to capture this. And uh, so I started documenting, and he, you know, he said he said to me right right when I came in, he says, you know, he said we both made agreements to incarnate this incarnation and do this work together, and I said I know, and we 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 acknowledged that right away that that's what was happening with us. So even though I became one of his fourteen wives, and I was always with him. And I'm still with him now, doing the work, because I, I guess it's because I have the archives and I'm still working with him. Um, that's just the way it's been. It was, it was, it's never been questioned, and uh, I don't know where I'm going with that. There was a reason, but whatever. Yeah. So anyhow, we both knew that what our purpose was, and um, I started taping morning meditation because it was just so awesome. And I've got like a thousand tapes, cassette tapes, that thank God somebody partnered with with me and we're making them into series. Carl Anderson of Global Recording Artists has been working, you know, seven, eight years with me and my source partner, Electricity. And uh, we've got, it's like the real deal. You can listen to that happening in that timing, with no interference, if you ever want to know, get a get a take on the family, father, any of it. All you have to do is listen to these tapes. They they recorded it. I recorded the band. Uh, we we figured out we had musicians that were in the family, and father started forming musical bands, and we set up a music room and. And they, they did 69 albums. And uh, to this day, they're coveted. They're, you know, Yahoo 13 among musicians uh, are, is a very coveted uh, music because it was spontaneous. It was ahead of its time. And it's very respected. So, I mean, it was just, we, we, we had music, our dress, our designs. We, you know, you... After our, I came out with the book, and we did a documentary, and some of these images started coming out. We, I had Vogue, Bazaar. I had, like, all of these magazines doing uh, write-ups on us of, of our clothing, our designs. There were designers actually paying homage to the Source family in, 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 in some of the dresses they were putting out. Oh, wow. and, and Yeah. And the same with um, restaurants. There was a restaurant called Cafe Gratitude that's a California chain. And they were inspired by the source. And they're a vegan restaurant. 
and uh, they kind of did the same thing we did. They became very famous with with the Hollywood elite, <laughs> you know, just like the source was. So. So, so this this wasn't something that was existing, you know, up in the Hollywood Hills, and nobody knew. This wasn't Manson, you know, not to, to compare you no. to a cult, but this wasn't something no, that was we, happening. No, you can compare us because we have been compared. No matter what happens with Manson, it always brings in the source, and no matter what I've done with the source, Manson's always brought into it. We even had our preview, our, our premiere of our film at the silent movie theater in L.A. in Fairfax, this amazing little venue. And their next filming after us was the Manson film. There was two photos on the, on the marquee out front. One was of Father and the Source family, and then one was of Charles Manson. It was like, I went, my God. This is never going to (laughs) end. But it was like the light and the dark, the good, the bad, you know. Well, I I mean, I, 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 well, we're going to take a break here in a moment so we can get kind of more into that uh, in in a moment when we come back. But, um, but, but my point is that this isn't something that was, that nobody knew what was going on. You, it seems like the source family was very out in the open and and that people were aware of what was going on. Yeah. Oh, we were. Yeah. Well, Jim Baker was, He's, he was a Hollywood legend to begin with. Everybody knew him, and everybody knew him when he opened the source and had the source family, you know? I mean, we were down on Sunset Boulevard every day at our our restaurant. There was, you know, anybody could come and talk to us and see us. We, our house was not open. If you wanted to come up to the house, you had to let us know you wanted to come up, and, and it was usually for, you'd have to go to morning meditation, <laughs> Which a lot of people did. Steve Allen did, but Steve Allen was a really good friend of Jim Baker's. And he would come up every once in a while. And he made a famous quote, which I have in in the book. He says, if you ever wanted to know the Renaissance image of God, he said, you couldn't do any better than Father Yod. Wow. You know, I know. I mean, it's just like there is so much, Jim. You have no idea. There is just so much. Well, we'll get into some more of it when we come back. We're going to take our next break. Uh, When we come back, we'll find out what it was like, you know, just the day-to-day life of being part of the Source family. We'll also find out uh, as we go on about this, you know, what... Who else was involved? Who else was part of this? And uh, and and what happened, of course, to Father Yod, and also what happened to the rest of the family after that. So, uh, still plenty more of fascinating information coming your way as we continue on with the program. And if you want to find out more about our guest, Isis Aquarian, just go to midnight.fm. And when you go onto the page there, right at the top, you'll see her photo. Click on that. That will bring you over to the page for tonight's show with all of her information. We do that for each and every one of our guests here on the program every night. You can always find it there uh, right at midnight.fm talking about the beginnings of of the Source family and uh, the beginnings of Jim Baker's transition into into Father Yo. And I want to go back to that for just a moment. Uh, You know, was there a was there a moment? When this transition happened, where he said, you know, I'm now known as Father Yoda, or was it something that became a gradual thing over time? It, well, I think it was kind of both. It started gradually. Uh, He started out just being, well, in the beginning when there was probably seven people that were forming the family because they worked at the source and they all kind of started gathering and living together, they started they even called them Jim at, at, for for a little time there. And then they started calling him Father because he wasn't their master or guru. He was their spiritual father now. And so he was known as Father for a little bit. And then people started coming in actually quite fast. And it morphed from Father to Father Yod. So it was basically, you know, he was basically Father Yod for for the most of the time. And during the latter part, uh, before it all ended, he was Yehoah. So it's, you know, yeah. Well, I was going to say, it seems like that it was, you know, it was a very organic thing then. It wasn't this, it wasn't this desire to be a guru as much as it was becoming a guru because people followed him. Right. He said, he said, right, God, right from the very beginning, he says, you know, 
He says, this is my journey. <laughs> he says, I don't know where it's going to take me. He said, but I'm going on it. And he says, it's, but it's my journey. And if you want to come along, I can guarantee it's going to be fun. But he made it very clear that this was his process, his journey that he was going on, and that there would come a point where all of us were going to have to then go on our journey and find our destiny. You know, we it, it got very interesting because, of, of course, going on that journey with him all those years, we were part of it, so it became our journey, too. So it, it, it got very interesting because he tried to break up the family three times. He said, I've given you everything I know. It's time for the little birdies to fly off the branch. You need to go out now and do your journey, and nobody would go. And that's why it basically ended up him flying off of the cliff in a hand glider well, it, he left. I, I, I know, and we'll certainly get into that. Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to shortchange that, or uh, we'll, we'll we'll dive into that pretty deeply. You know, no no pun intended. But the the idea no, right. is, is uh, I, sometimes I just say dumb things anyway. Um, the idea, though, it sounds like to me that it was, you know. I'm, I'm trying to just determine, or, or or maybe maybe it doesn't matter how much of the following came about from his charisma or people seeing what what it was that he was learning and what it was that he was going through and saying, I want some of that. Because, you know, for a lot of these spiritual leaders, that's what it is. It's a combination of both. That it's both, you yeah. know, you're interested in what they're doing, but you're also enamored with the person as well. Absolutely. And how, and how could you not be, you know, especially if they're a good example. He was very open and very truthful. That was the thing about him that distinguished him from all all the other leaders that were happening was, man, everything was on the table out front. There was no secrets, and he would n never, if somebody said something or asked, he never told a lie. It was all out. And um, like with his women, uh, Yogi Bhajan had mistresses, but he kept them in the closet. He, he denied it and would never admit it to anybody. And Father Yo said, I'm not doing that. He said, I have my women, and I'm going to respect them. They're not going into a source closet. He said, in fact, they're going to lead. They're going to be out front. I'm, I'm, I'm going. He started the journey of elevating women, you know, long before that became popular <laughs> these days. You know, he gave the women the power, and it became a mom. Um, matriarchal society with a patriarchal head is what it, it, it basically was. And he formed a council, and we were in charge of the family, with, of course, him being the supreme head. But, I mean, there's, there's a lot of belief systems that, that look upon having multiple wives as, as being okay that, you know, and I know in some cases, you know, I, I can already hear people arguing with me, you know, through the radio and, and through their computer or what have you. <laughs> I, there, I know that there are some people that utilize it as a, because they, they demean the women by it and they think them less than, and, and, and that they're supposed to be there to serve, serve the man. I'm not talking about yeah. it in that, in that sense. I'm saying that there's a lot of belief systems in which you don't have to be faithful to one person, no matter who that person is, that the idea of being faithful is, is almost a, it's almost a construct of the belief system that we have developed outside of the relationship. I don't know. I don't know if I can put it into a belief or words. All I know is, uh, uh King Solomon, King David, they had like, what, 900 wives? I don't know. That's been, I read that somewhere. That's, that's a lot of birthdays to remember. Yes, I know. But um, he did, you know, just, he respected women. And if you were his woman, you were his woman. And that came and went. We were actually sealed as his wives in San Francisco. He sealed 12 of us as his wives when we were in San Francisco, and that was it. That was his women from that point on. Nobody left. Nobody came in. 
that way it was distinguished. But the thing is, is we were all sisters before we were his wives. You know, the women lived with each other. We knew each other. And um, I don't know. I, I'm i sure there were issues. Um, I never really got caught up in, in any of them, and I didn't really... I can't even really say that I witnessed any anything serious among the women. It all got taken care of. If there was an issue, all they had to do was go to him, and he took care of it. You know. Sure. I mean, problems like that are always gonna gonna pop up. But it, the important and, and wait, wait. I got this is important. I'm sorry. Sure. I'm really sorry. And the thing, also, the thing about him was, if he was with a woman, that's who he was with, and that was respected. We didn't have orgies. You know. It was one on one, so everybody got what they needed. You know, he took very good care of that situation and us. Well, and, and the important thing is, is the the women who were involved in this did it by their own free accord. Yes, they did at the time, but this will probably segue into as we get into the family dispersing, and years later, when we all started coming together for reunions. Uh, some people felt like it, they didn't, they felt like, some people now felt like that's not what they really wanted to do or they were talked into it. Mm-hmm. When now that they look back, which I don't understand, but that was a turning point for me in realizing we didn't all have the same experience or take from everything that happened. You know, I was... There was one situation we were talking about, and five people all said, no, that's not the way I saw it. We all saw it a different way. And that was a major breakthrough for all of us to know that we all didn't, we were all there and got out of it on a one to one level that had nothing to do with anybody else. We all didn't get out of it the same thing. We all didn't see it the same way. We all weren't there for the same lessons or reasons. But we all will say that if we had to do it again, we wouldn't have changed it for anything. We, some of them say, well, I might not now. I would go, no, I wouldn't do that, or no, I wouldn't have done that. But I wouldn't have changed it. Everybody's really respectful of what they had and what we went through, because it was really pretty, very, very awesome. And he was awesome. You couldn't have been with somebody better if that's what you were going to be going through in that time period. He, he was absolutely the ultimate person to, to, to be doing that with. I mean, you know, appointing you the... He was funny. Oh, my God. I'm sorry. No, but... no, go ahead. <laughs> he was funny. Oh, my God. He was so quick, and he was so intuitive, and he was so honest, and he was so funny, and it was never a dull moment. Oh, jeez. You know, it's just like, uh, go ahead. Well, I, w- I was going to say, it sounds like, uh, you know, in, in asking you to be the historian and, 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 and to, to be chronicling what was going on with the family, uh, was it, do you think that it was as much just to have the history of it recorded uh, for the furtherance of the movement? Or is it also a, a, an idea of, you know, I don't want to get caught up in some of the things that these other these other groups get caught up in, and I I want to be I want to be transparent about it. So if I have somebody, you know, kind of handling all of that, there will be a there'll be a transparency, there'll be an accountability. All of it. He didn't know. He didn't want me taking pictures. He didn't want me transcribing. He didn't want me doing any of it. He says I don't want to be this to end up dogma. He and you know he fought it. And I said, no way, I'm doing it. This is my commitment. This is why I'm here and I'm doing it. In fact, six weeks into me doing it, in the middle of the night, he had five of the brothers come in while I was asleep and take everything I had done, everything. Everything I had recorded, everything I had documented, everything I had written, shred it, tear it, cut it and throw it in a dumpster that I would not find. I woke up the next morning and literally it was the only time I got mad at him and I totally lost it. 
and I just like got in his face big time, <laughs> and I said, "Well, I'm just going to start all over again." And I just started all over again. He laughed and he said, "Well, I tried." And then from then on, he gave me full reign and told everybody to cooperate, and that's what I, that's what happened. So then, you know, you have the. Yeah, I would think at that point, the. Uh, I mean, it sounds like a weird way to put it, but vindication that you know you were right that there there was a reason to chronicle this that and yes. you know the obviously the feeling of what you had lost in, in losing that material shows how important it was yes it was some of the best stuff <laughs> it's like still to this day it was it's like a little er for me because it was the best stuff it was the beginning and and it, it, there there wasn't another time like that but that was, you know, a lesson for me, too, not to get so caught up in it. What was there, um, you know, was there a, a dissemination of any of this material while the family was active? Were you, you know, were there, was there newspaper stories done or, you know? Yes, we had, we had numerous write-ups, newspaper, TV people, radio people, people from other countries uh, would come and not even speak English and interview us, and we'd end up in their papers and magazines, you know, in their language. We were called the millionaire hippies in one article. And, uh, yeah, it, was, it, it never ended. You know, we, we, were, um, we were iconic and we were known and we were famous, uh, even though... A lot of people didn't know about us or hear about us unless you were, you know, in, in I guess, certain genres or in California. But, um, and then we went, you know, and then after the family dispersed, we went into the source closet for years. And, and because I, you know, had the archives. When we, when, when the family dispersed, everybody just walked out the door and left everything. And I went, well, God, now what? You know, so I just, boxes and boxes and boxes I had to take and, and luck around for 50 years and um, be responsible for it. And about 20 years ago, I just was looking at them and went, this is nuts, you know, this isn't right. I got to do something with this. And uh, that's when uh, a source brother, Electricity, and I formed a partnership, and we spent seven years trying to write the first book. And that was absolutely daunting, trying to figure out time frames, because we didn't live in time. We we didn't do time, and it's hard for me to do time now. And to, and to realize that in such a short amount of time, so much happened, it was, you know, blew a few fuses trying to figure out the this, this story and, and ask other family members and get it right. And other family members didn't want this book done. They, some of their, their people, some of their family people, they married, their kids never even knew about the Source family, didn't even know they'd been in a commune. And so it was, a, a, you know, a big coming out of the source closet for everybody and people were kind of freaking out. They, they didn't want their kids to find out certain things, you know, cause sure, yeah. we did talk trick for sex magic and, and, you know, um, and that's how we didn't have lust when we, we were together. It was very sacred, you know, and so it was all going to come out and, then Jody Willie came aboard with Process Media and Feral House. In fact, that's how I got this interview was through Christine at Feral House through, through Michelle, the producer, and um, they did our book. And then, then a documentary came out and won all kinds of awards. And we spent two years touring with the documentary. And you know, it's being the book is being reprinted now in other languages. Uh, right now, we're working on the French edition. So it's like, you know, it's 50 years later and it's still, I'm almost 80 and it's still happening. It's still very relevant, alive and well. 
I gave, uh, finally, I gave all my archives to the UC Santa Barbara uh, prestigious uh, Hamilton Library. It was about probably one of the best things I ever did, because that'll be there now for hundreds of years after all of us are gone for scholars and students. I mean, if I believe in reincarnation, I'll probably reincarnate back and find some of the stuff that I did and look right. at it and go, wow, these people were really cool. (laughs) (laughs) I wished I was there. Just like we do now with things. I, God, I'm finding stuff in the 1920s that are just so familiar. Do do you not do that? Oh, it happens to me all the time. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's just like, God, consciousness is a very interesting thing but go ahead well i was gonna say i always feel like you know drawn to certain eras and i'm like well why and yes. maybe it's because i was in those times you know yes yes i cannot tell you how many young people have grasped on to this uh legacy and then the legacy got saved by the book and the documentary thank god but you know kids that are 17 18 early 20s and they go I wished I had been born. I wished I was there. And I just go, well, you probably were. You're old enough to maybe pass over and come back. I mean, if you're that drawn to him or that, you know. Well, I want to, I want to talk for a second though, about what you just said about the, the book coming out, about the, the, the film coming out. And, I, I'm sure as much as you poured, you know, is all that you could into the book and, and, and as, as well as the movie may have come out, it's, it's still going to be hard to convey for people after the fact, what it was like to be there and, and to be part of it. Uh, do you, do you think though that, you know, it's, it's, it's come close to kind of conveying the, the feeling that you felt when you were, when you were with everybody else? Um, I, I think we're all doing a better job of it as we ourselves become more in tune. Like every interview I do, I get a different flash on it or a different perspective or a different way of looking at the same thing myself. And, and, and it becomes more fine-tuned. And also, I really believe it will never be completely able to be conveyed unless you were there. It was a... It wasn't an experience that unless you experienced it, you cannot get it 100%, nor should you. You know, like I can't get 100% what it would be like to, been, to have been in the Holocaust mm-hmm. or, or, or a bombing in Japan uh, during the war. I, th- I, I can grasp it, but not 100% like somebody that was there. And so this was our... Uh, this is our adventure that we had as 150 of us with a source family with Father Yod, and it was ours, and it was in a very unique time frame. And it only worked in the way it did because it was in that time frame. I think a lot of what happened then in the way it did, if you took it and tried to do it now, it would some of it would not work, nor would some of it be appropriate for now. So in saying that, a lot of what happened back then was a different time frame. And happening in that time frame it made a little better sense. So people now are trying to go back with a time frame of now and thoughts of now. And they go back and they're they're judging certain things from that time frame or trying to make right. it fit or tear it apart. And and that's not fair. That's just not fair. And and, and also, you know, the the just the moralities of now are different. You know, the, the people yes. the people who are uh, and you know, the people who were involved in the source family then, you know, they might feel differently about what they did earlier. They might say, well, uh, that was, I was a different person then, or. And they I was, were, we were exactly. I, I mean, just because it's not of, you know, the modern times, it, it doesn't mean that the people are, uh, need to be ostracized in this time because they were part of it back then. Yeah, exactly. You get it, Jim. Thank you. Well, I mean, it, it's just something that I see happen all the time where, you know, we, we judge everybody based on, uh, 
you know who they were before and and the, not what they become and i'm you know not not to make it uh, you know this uh, this a political discussion but you hear people talking about when uh, when there's a candidate for office you know they talk about what they did in their teens their 20s their 30s and now they're in their 50s it's their not 60s fair. it's not fair as if somebody can't evolve as a human being and and learn yeah. from their mistakes yeah but but it's fair to be tagged with it because that is part of your thread and and it, I think it's fair to own up to it, but sure. I don't think it's fair to try to disseminate it in the consciousness of the now when it happened in a different time frame. It happened in a different incarnation. It's like remembering a past incarnation before we're born and now trying to go back and comment on it. You know, you just, that's not, that's not fair. Yeah. It has everything has to stay in its time frame, and it's everything has a little box that it needs to stay in. Right. It, it needs. Once, there needs to be. You're out of it. There needs to be a conversation about it, but you know it doesn't. It, it, listen, hey, they just released the Muppet Show on Disney Plus, and they have a disclaimer in front of some of the episodes because they <laughs> might have things that are offensive now that weren't offensive then, and people are yeah. like, "Well, why don't you just cut that out of the show?" Well, because it's still part of the show's legacy and you can still show it and explain why it might be offensive. I don't, know, I don't want to get on a soapbox, yeah. but yeah, we'll, I know, I know, I know. We'll, we'll, we'll but take anyhow. our, we'll take our next break here. And when we come back, let's talk a little bit about, you know, the day to day life of being part of the source family and all that was involved in it. And then we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about, uh, you know, father Yod's final, you know, journey. And, and then we'll talk about some of the things that happened after that as well. So during the break, uh, again, if you want to find out more, more about our guest Isis Aquarian just go to midnight society uh, midnight.fm rather and click on the midnight society guest page at the top of the page there you'll see her photo click on that that will give you all the information about her it will also give you all the information about the music that we play on the program which comes from the rentals and uh, for those of you who aren't familiar uh, you know Matt Sharp was one of the members of Weezer when they first hit it big and then he went off and formed the rentals they had a hit with Friends of P and then last year they put out an album called Q36 that is inspired by the kinds of topics that we discuss on this program in fact it was Art Bell that inspired uh, much of the songs on the Q36 album. So there's also the Z36 remix album, and what we play here are some special remixes of that uh, that Matt provided to us to use as our music here on the program. So and we're getting the real story of the Source family. You know, forget what you might have read in articles and things like that. We are talking about what really happened from somebody who not only was there and lived through it, but also documented it and uh, and, and works as the historian uh, remembering it all and, and, and keeping all of the uh, information ac as accurate as possible and certainly uh, sharing with us what it's like to really have been part of it. And that's something that I want to discuss here a little bit is, you know, the day-to-day -day life of this. It, it, to some people, it sounds, you know, like it would be a great way to live, you know, a, a commune of everybody coming together and doing their part and, you know, just beliefs aside and, 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 and religious, uh, you know, spiritual growth, I should say, uh, aside, you know, just being able to work within a community is something that is you know, lost on a lot of people today. Yes, it, it, it's a working, it's a working uh, modality that, that should be used today. When, you know, years ago when, the, when ranchers and farmers started losing their land because they couldn't keep up the mortgage, I was dumbfounded. I kept saying, well, why don't they just have renters, you know, have uh, people come in and form a community where everybody helps out and takes care of each other, and you can keep everything together. It's just a concept of being tribal. We lost that instinct to be tribal. And that's basically what the communes were. It was reconnecting tribally uh, and working together, and 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 it worked. It worked. So, kind of walk us through what it was like. You know, a day in the life of the Source family. Well, we had um, we had businesses, and we had a band, and so some some of the uh, family were musicians, and they would go into the band room, and they would make albums, or they'd write songs, or um, we played the Whiskey A Go-Go. They went out, and we did things. There was always events, 
And then we had people, uh, the majority of the people would work the stores. They had different shifts. There was a time we had breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So, you know, the majority of the family was, was going down to the stores to work. And then we had the mothers with the children that stayed home. So we had that program happening with, you know, homeschooling and taking care of the children and, and women giving birth. And we had our midwives. And then we had, you know, the business part, the administrative part. And I was uh, part of being an administrator also. And then there was, you know, basically if you were one of Yehoah's wives, you... You know, if you weren't doing something, you got to just follow him around, <laughs> you know, or go up into his bedroom in, in the afternoon and just sit and, and talk or laugh or share or have lunch with him. So, I mean, it was like it was everybody had their, their thing to do, and we did it. It was very organized. We had heads of everything. We had, uh, I think, uh, got eight vans, and we had a Rolls Royce and a Mercedes, and so we somebody headed that up to make sure everything was always have gas in it and running and was on schedule. And if somebody needed it, they had to log it out. It was just like a little business within. We were like a village, you know. And and there was um, just we were very very busy, and then we all went to bed and went to sleep. And was very happy when that time came, <laughs> you know, because there was, you know, duties. Uh, the house had to be clean. Laundry had to be done. Can you imagine doing laundry every day for 150 people? And we all, we shared everything. There was a point where people had their own special robes or their own special things, but mostly it was just, you know, it was a communal grab. Uh, we had seamstress that sewed, and they would just make clothes for the women and robes for the men, and they'd be hung up in, in a central closet, and you just went and got a clean garb for the day, and, and then when you came home from night, you put it in the laundry, and the next day it got cleaned. I mean, it was, we were a very well-oiled community. We had it down. Jim Baker taught, taught us the rules of order and organization, and to this day, a lot of the men say, I'm running my business by the rules I was taught by Father Yo during the source days, and they're very successful. It, it seems... And we had a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun. And we basically really all did get along, you know. We, we really did respect each other, and we allowed everybody to be whoever they were. We had people that we had a couple people that came in that couldn't even speak English, you know. Um, we had different nationalities. We had, you know, different, different, different races. We had different backgrounds, and we all helped each other and worked with each other. And, um, if something couldn't get straightened out, and there were times where it got a little iffy and there were some issues and some things didn't get worked out, it could always be brought up that morning in morning meditation and it got worked out or it got taken to Father if, if, if somebody else couldn't take care of it. We had a saying, if, one or, if two people or more said the same thing, whether you believed it or heard it, you had to listen to it enough to at least give it a try to be right. And then you go to Father if that didn't work. So it, it really seems like it was, you know, nobody was serving anybody. You know, everybody was kind of carrying their own portion of the community, but that it was, you know, people doing it because it was part of their, their, their own journey to be part of this greater whole. Yes, and it would behoove each person to make sure that everything was as amazing as it was so that it could be amazing for them because that's that's what they were living within. You know, there was flowers put around the house. Uh, the house was always kept clean. Uh, the food was amazing. Uh, we cherished our cup of coffee in the morning and morning meditation we did do what we call the sacred herb every morning, and that was it. We didn't do drugs, 
and we didn't do it the rest of the day, but we did have, you know, our morning marijuana hit uh, for spiritual practices. So, I mean, you know, we didn't really lack anything. And, and you know, it, the women worked it out, the kids worked it out, the brothers worked it out, and um, there you go. And, I, and I'm sure, I'm, I mean, I hope I'm not just, you know, glossing over it. It's, and I'm sure that there were things had to get fine-tuned, and if you really got down to it, there, there was probably some gnarly issues. In fact, there were here and there, but they weren't anything that caused uh, unkindness. There was never any hurt or harm intended. We really believed in being kind. And uh, we all knew that with Father there is the glue. It didn't matter what happened, what was said, what needed to be worked out. We were within that safety net that it would get worked out because he was there, and we all trusted him. He had proven himself over and over and over to us that he was fair and he was true and he was honest and that he loved us, and he wanted only the best for us as an individual and as a whole for this communal family. Well, I mean, I would imagine that if you live in a in a little you know, conclave of society that believes in in that, then it really makes it easier to get past any issues that you might end up having that pop up with each other because you know in the end everybody's intentions are pure. You know, there's yeah. no there's no reason to be suspicious of uh, you know when somebody says they're sorry, you can you can believe that they're sorry. Exactly, and and we had a, a rule too of anybody new coming in. They were on a 30-day probation. You know, they used to come in and start, you know, having sex with, with one of the women or one of the men. If you were a woman, you had to wait 30 days. And you had to to know what you were doing, and you had to understand what it was, would, would be like to be there. And you had to agree to it uh, when your 30 days were, were up. And we had, I don't, I don't. I don't remember anybody ever leaving. There was a couple of people that left here and there after a while for whatever reason. And I know it came up about uh, being um, um, gay or homosexual. How did we handle that? Father loved everybody. He embraced the gay people. He embraced uh, homosexuals. He, he said that that was not the, this family's program so you could stay if you were gay, and you could stay if you were a homosexual, but you could not. That could not be your practice. That could not be your practice while you're in the family, because that's not the program that we were on at that time. So it wasn't. It and, wasn't judgmental. And Jim Baker was famous for for embracing when he had before he even opened the stores when he had the old world is best friend was a, was this gay woman that ran his, the old world, and he loved her to death. He absolutely loved this woman, and he talked about her through the whole source family days. Her name was Gus, <laughs> and Gus, he said, was the best friend he ever had, you know, so, and, and so there were, there were gay couples that came in, and, and they loved father, and they, they did leave, but they left right. They left with uh, his blessing, and they love, left loving him and understanding. So it was just amazing how it all got worked out. I, I want to take a step back, too, uh, just to, to something you said a few moments ago when you talked about, you were talking about the cars that you had. And I want to I want to clarify something because I know it will come up in the mind of people who question, you know, the commune mentality. So there was money behind what you were doing, but it's coming from the businesses, we right? We were so wealthy, Tim. We didn't, we were so extremely wealthy. As I said, they called us the millionaire hippies. We lived in a mansion, but we had, we weren't extravagant. We didn't spend our money. We didn't buy stuff from the outside. We made our clothes. It's not like we were wearing designer clothes or carrying Prada bags. No, we weren't doing any of that. We were wearing uh, homespun cotton robes and, and silk and satin dresses that we made ourselves. Um, the money went to things like band equipment, building the band room, <laughs> you know, um, 
our our living room, which was our meditation room, was completely empty because we sat on the floor every morning. We would come in and sit on on a pillow or a sheepskin or or, or just just the floor because we had a carpet in there, and so we weren't material wise. We weren't extravagant, and nobody owned anything. We shared everything, and uh, so. You know, we we had 12 vans because we had to all get around. We had to have, you know, to get people to work or to the stores. Uh, Father had a Rolls because he always had a Rolls Royce, and he loved it as Jim Baker. And he says, you know what? I'm keeping my Rolls because I want to show you off. We're not, we're not from the outback. We're not poor hippies. He said, but we're not extravagant either. It doesn't mean anything to us, and it really didn't, you know. And what he did with the roles, and, and, and a couple of times he would get some of the younger people that came into the family had no life experience. He wanted to give them some life experience, so they would go out in groups to the Brown Derby and the roles, or they would go to these chastens, or he would give them an opportunity to experience some of the finer things in life and to, and, and, and to start having some experiences of what might be out there that they wouldn't be able to gain because now they were in the source. And, uh, you know, we did that for a little bit. And then money was spent to send some of the family to go to South America and, and and to try to find a place for us to live when we thought we were going to maybe, you know, we weren't always going to live in L.A. There was a mentality among many people of that time, and it wasn't just us, it was many people, that, you know, there was a catastrophe going to come. The world might, to some degree, come to what we know as an end, but not the end, and, you know, or, or a bomb or something. And that was a mentality that's been happening since the 50s. I remember with Cuba, when we lived in Florida, we all, school drills, we had to get under the desk because Cuba was going to bomb us. That, that was going on even before the hippies and the source. But we, we knew that there would come a point where we should get out of the city, we should get out of L.A., we should get some land, we should grow our own food. And, uh, you know, that did end up happening a, a couple of years after we were, we were formed in L.A. We did end up leaving. Well, I mean, I think, yeah, there's, there's, there's a mentality that comes about when you have that kind of freedom to say, you know, <clears throat> things are taken care of. And so things are taken care of, you know, if you have enough money to take care of them. But things are also taken care of if you don't need a lot of the things that require money. So, you know, we didn't need anything. Yeah. When you're when you're we living just needed each other, that and, was all we needed. And, and having that mindset, you know, kind of frees you to not be burdened by. I mean, uh, people say, oh, you know, it, just, you know, as an example, they say, oh, it'd be nice to be rich and then I don't have to worry about anything. Right. Because then you can actually do the things that you want to do or that you're meant to do. And right. you can actually ponder the bigger questions because not every waking moment is spent either worrying about going to work or, you know, you know you're going to work then because you love it, not because you need to uh, make sure that the bills are paid. Right. And everybody that came into the family gave up everything. We didn't bring any, you didn't bring anything in with you because there would be nothing you could bring in that, that would be the lifestyle, you know? So people that came in, if they had money, if they had a house, if they had a car, they either got rid of it, gave it to a family member, or they gave it to the to the source family. You know, and you came in and you gave up everything. You had nothing. So we all depended on each other. And it really helped that we were every day having huge amounts of money coming in. <laughs> we never really had to worry about anything. So with with uh, what you were saying too before about uh, many of the many of the people of the time felt that there was some sort of uh, it sounded like an apocalyptic event almost. Uh, yes. So so 
was that part of the teaching of 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 Father Yod that there was an end that was coming? Yes, we we lived we lived that. Yes, there was a point where where yes, we we were trying to figure out. Well, if it comes and we're all annihilated, then then thank God we've got some degree of consciousness that we elevated ourselves. You know, we evolved ourselves more into a spiritual being, or we believed that we were star beings to begin with, that we came from the stars. And uh, uh, so there was like, so we would either go back home to our home planet, or we would reincarnate again on this planet like we did this last this lifetime and and help or form or you know we talked about all the times that earth was destroyed whether it was Noah in the flood whether it was allegorically or true or dinosaurs being extinct or the whole population of the of uh, the uh, what do they call the Yucatan what are those pyramids there that uh, that race of people that just uh, disappeared the Mayan, nobody the Mayan, ever Mayan the Mayans yep. yeah you know, what what happened, what happened to everybody, and, you know, and, and things, we've, we've had destruction on this planet since the beginning, and and we felt it absolutely coming again because it had gotten so out of control. This planet was not operating on us, on its heritage of being a spiritual frequency it was it's been very dark for a long time it's been very shadowy and underbelly and which hopefully it's starting to come to light and come to an end and there's got to come a point where you know that song the age of aquarius really can happen and we can start becoming you know back into our godhood more and be more of a a white body and being more of a spiritual planet and a spiritual being, um, this planet is kind of dark and a mess in a lot of ways, and it just comes to a point where it can't continue being this way or it will have to start all over again. And I do believe there's been times that it's had to start all over again. I mean, that's been recorded. Yeah, we don't need the world to blow up for for it to end. So, yes, there was definitely, like I said, and it was the mindset of many people of that time frame. It wasn't just us. It was a very prevalent uh, uh, topic. Well, it felt, uh, I'm going to say, it it probably felt like an apocalyptic time anyway. Because, you know, you're worried about nuclear weapons, and nuclear energy is coming about. Uh, You know, you have the Vietnam War going on. Uh, there, there's a lot of things happening that just would, I could certainly understand why it makes you feel a sense of we're doomed. Yeah, yeah. And it was prophesized. I mean, you know, there was, uh, uh, Nostradamus was big, his prophecies were big at that time, and other prophecies that, that yeah, that something was going to happen. So, so did, did, how, did that affect you know, the way that people lived or did they look at it more as a, you know, there's nothing we can do about it. So we'll just be the best, you know, citizens of the world that we can be until that day comes. Yep. All of it. (laughs) You had to do degrees of all of it, not only with us, but everybody, you know, especially in, 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 in around us, you know, the whole LA like I said, L.A. was in Hollywood. There's just something about that whole area that's been going on for hundreds of years that draws people and things and events that people can spring off of. And, um, you know, the societies before us from the 1920s had, you know, the same kind of beliefs that we were doing again. It's like we, we, we found out we're just picking up on something that had already been started and then faded out and is starting again. And it, and it definitely seems to, to happen in cycles that, you know, yes. they're, they're just as, you know, the Source family had its time, there's other organizations and other groups that have come through uh, and, yep. and it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't stop. I mean, there's, there's a yeah. reason why. Yeah. We're the, 
well, we're the old guard now, and we're still standing. And it amazes me that, that I don't know of a time really, I would say, okay, recent history that you can remember where, you know, the old guard still made it through and is standing with the new. You know, this this generation is, we, we really feel bonded and we really feel as one. We, oh, I, I, the young people don't see, like when I did, uh, you know, with the source tours, when we did the, the book and the documentary and, and um, a lot of young people came, a, a lot of young people, and we didn't see really a whole lot of difference. They didn't see me as an old person. I didn't see them as a young person. We were just humanity wanting something better and wanting to understand and them wanting to gleam off of what we went through because they resonated with it and they didn't know what to do about it because nobody's doing it now. People aren't living communally. They're starting to. They're starting to form group homes because they have. that's the only way anybody can hardly live anymore for many reasons. They're doing senior homes now, you know, or communal homes or... Um, Neighborhoods are going, uh, I don't act as a word for it, but, um, well, I mean, I, anyhow, I, I can tell you, I, I've lived in, in my house now for 15 years and I think I've had maybe, you know, three conversations with the guy across the street in all that time. <laughs> there's, and, and there's, there's neighbors that live like right near me that I've never even spoken to. So. I kind of get know. I get an idea of what you're saying. We're we're going to we're going to take our next break. When we come back, uh we'll talk about, you know, what what went on with Father Yod and uh, where everything went from there. We're back. We're wow. talking tonight with Isis Aquarian about the Source family and we're getting all of the inside story from someone who not only was part of it but also is the historian for it and documented everything that went on and we've been talking about you know what it was like to be living in this commune and to be uh, living amongst father yod and in learning his teachings and uh, being part of his spiritual journey and you had mentioned earlier isis that he actually tried three times to break up the family can you kind of walk us through what happened in those instances yep um well you know when you have such a large family like that and 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 you're thinking, okay, we're going to all move out of L.A. and and you know Hawaii came up, uh, moving to Hawaii because it was kind of like going to another country, but staying in the protection of the America. Right, and, and and not to not to interrupt, but I should probably ask this question: How many people were in the family, like at its peak? Uh, I it had a core of 150. Wow, I know. Is there were times it was much more, but I would I just go by 150 because it was pretty much the core. It's pretty much what it what it was. There was times it was 200, maybe 250. Yeah, and so that yeah, it started getting to, to a point where we had to start figuring out some other stuff. But when we did decide to leave LA, it was a um, around 19, the ending of 1974, and we did go to Hawaii. And so right before we left, it was like he said, you know, not everybody needs to go. You know, he said, now this is another whole journey where we used to being taken care of, and, and um, you know, nobody's had to go outside the family to work. We all, we, it, you just go down to the source and work, and you come home. He said, I don't know what it's going to be like once we leave L.A., uh, where we're loved and accepted and and, and secured. We're, we're going in a whole new territory now. Unless we can get something started real quick, everybody's going to have to go out and find jobs, and it's going to be a new way of life. And so he says, you know, any uh, this could be a good time to, to disperse the family, he said somewhat. Anybody who feels like they need to go out now on their journey says, I've given you everything that you need. He says, there's really no reason, you know, to stay if, if you're feeling the calling not to. And nobody, nobody did. Nobody wanted to leave. And so we it all ended up in Hawaii. And it just, once we left L.A. and left our, our um, 
our cocoon. It's like that was our birth. That was our manger. Um, it, it all went downhill from there very quickly. We hit uh, Kauai and Hawaii, and they thought we were the Manson family. They were not ready. We made a mistake. We made the mistake of going in full force of 150 people uh, in their small little communities in town, walking the streets in robes, and then thinking we were going to take over. They did not know who we were. They didn't know what we wanted, what we were going to do. All they knew about was Charles Manson. And it freaked the locals out, literally freaked the island out. And they were very hostile to us. They came uh, by our house one day and started shooting guns. And that was that. Father wow. knew we had to get out of there. You know? Uh, so he, he didn't know where we were going to go. So that's when he said, I'm going to go see if we can find somewhere out of America. We'll go to Europe. And he went and he took uh, a few people with him, and he, he did. He went to India. He went, you know, around to a few few places and um, realized that that wasn't going to work. South America, we should stay in the protection of America. We were Americans. He loved the Founding Fathers. He loved the whole American thing. We always had a 13-star flag flying in our driveway. And um, he came back to San Francisco, and he thought, well, maybe we'll, maybe we'll try San Francisco. It's a pretty liberal place, and it's in California. They knew about us. And we ended up with a huge mansion called the Atherton Mansion, which is a very famous house. You can still look it up. Uh, Herb Cain wrote us up as saying we saved it from the wrecking ball, but we, we never got a toehold, and we weren't really accepted, and we couldn't hit the ground running. We couldn't get another restaurant going, and and the brothers couldn't get a job. They could not go out and work and get a job, you know, and and that, that there was starting to be no money to take care of everybody. People were not starting to be taken care of. And, and so at the San Francisco house, Father laid it down. He says, if you do not have a job in three days, you're out. You go out and you get a job and you help support this family. We cannot live off of the monthly payments that I sold the source for is not going to take care of all of us. And it just didn't work out. We couldn't do it. So, And uh, when we hit San Francisco, we actually hit Mel Valley, and we lived out of moving vans because we couldn't find a place to live. And we stayed in churches, and that was like for 40 days and 40 nights. It, we lived right from the Bible. Everything that the Bible said about that, it was true, <laughs> until we found the Atherton Mansion. And then we weren't there very long. Uh, Father knew that wasn't the place for us. It was uh, gray, rainy, and cold, and we couldn't get a toehold in. And, um, and he couldn't disperse us. He tried, he tried, he tried. He said, I'm going back to Hawaii. We'll go to another island, the big island. He took a few of us and flew over, and and we started getting a toehold on the big island of, of uh, Hawaii. They somehow accepted us, loved us. We found a place to live. Uh, the brothers started forming their own um, uh, working forces. Uh, um, they would... They they formed their own business themselves instead of going out and getting a job. And some of the brothers went out and did get jobs. And so that started working out. And we opened up a little bakery and like a little little kind of, not a restaurant, but, you know, just a little place to grab something to eat. And um, he tried to disperse us again and that nobody would go. And so one of the brothers was on Oahu, another island, Mercury. He was going to send, uh, 
he was going to try to nail down the hand gliding record by staying in the air the longest. And Father decided to come to Oahu to do that with him. And so he came, we came over to Oahu, and it was enough of the break from the family, because we ended up staying there about six weeks, that a disconnect was starting to happen. Father was able to make a disconnect from the family. And uh, that's when he decided, um, he didn't know, he said, I, I, he said, truth be known, I just would love for Makushla and I and a few of the family to live together somewhere, and, you know, and my women, and disperse the family. But he said, they will never leave me. They won't do it. They can't. And so one day, without us knowing it, he decided to go hand gliding with Mercury after he had already set the record, he did not want to go back, and he did not want to pursue the family any longer. And um, he went hand gliding, and um, the wind was absolutely whipping. I mean, we could hardly stand up on the mountain. We could hardly keep our our robes down. The wind was so strong, and as soon as he went off the cliff, the wind, I kid you not, Tim, it went completely still. It stopped, completely stopped, and his kite nosed down and went around, and when we went down, we found him in the park, and he wasn't bleeding. He didn't have any broken bones, and he was lucid, and he was talking to us, but he did say his back hurt, and he wanted to be taken home. So that started that journey, and uh, we did. We took him back to the house we were staying at and went through nine hours of... uh, We had an ambulance come with oxygen. Uh, We had a doctor come with light therapy. We did not, at that time, have a belief of going to the hospital or our surgery, or having our body altered. That was a, a prevalent teaching among many people of that time, being more one with nature and holistic. And at one point, he did say, do you think I should go to the hospital? He started, he, he said that was the Jim Baker part of him coming out, and and Makushla said to him, which was his main woman at the time, she said, you can do what you want. But it it will be going against your teachings. And he thought about it, and he made his own decisions. Nobody ever made a decision for him. He made his own decisions. I can tell you that. And he decided not to go. And nine hours later, there was a point where he was on the floor, stretched out because his back hurt. And we looked down, and he was gone. He had just left the body. And that's how that happened. Now, whether it makes sense to anybody or whether anybody's to blame or, or whether it's him or any of us, I, I I don't know. We couldn't have done anything. It was his decision. Well, I, I, and I... and that, that was that. And he had talked for months before that he even went over to Oahu about... He was ready to go himself. He says, I, I've done, I'm ready to go. He says, I don't even want to be here any longer. You know, it's not like he committed suicide. and It's not like he went up on a cliff and jumped off. No. He had a hand glider, and he left it up to fate. I think he definitely tempted fate. But I can tell you something. That was a very Jim Baker M.O., Jim Baker had done things like that his whole life, and nobody questioned it. When Father Yotes, when he was Yehoah at this time, when he says, I'm going to go hand gliding, it's like we were all shocked, and we tried to talk him out of it, but it was. we also know that that was very Jim Baker part of him, too. It wasn't something abnormal for him to have done. He was that kind of person his whole life. Well, I mean, it takes that kind of person to be a stuntman, sure. Exactly. So um, it just happened, and we also had a belief. 
of keeping the body for three and a half days undisturbed so it can review its river of life. And that's a belief that goes, that's a very ancient belief. Even the Hawaiians had, you know, the, the, the belief of the vigil, you know, of leaving one undisturbed. The Buddhists do, the monks do, you know, the Dalai Lama does. Um, you know, they, they, they want, uh, Jesus said, I just need my three days in the tomb, right? <laughs> and then the stone was rolled away. So it's, we gave him his three days. And then all hell broke loose and everybody found out. You know, especially uh, Elaine Baker and, and the kids, his ex-wife and his three sons. And um, it caused a lot of problems. Well, I mean, I, I can just imagine. I mean, how... Uh... It was gnarly. It was a gnarly on a lot of levels for a lot of people. And then the family back in, in, in Hilo completely like, well, you know... What the heck just happened? Now what? You know? And everybody just, we tried to stay together. Uh, we, we did stay together for almost two years after that, but it just, it didn't work. We came in for father. Father was gone, and the, the, the glue that held it together was just no longer there. And we truly realized it really was time for all of us to go out now and, and you know, do our own path and journey, and um, that's what what happened. I had the archives, so I've been always working on them and projects. So I pretty much have stayed in that frequency. I called it. I've kind of never really left the source energy or Father. He's been with me every day because it's here. It's all around. And my whole house is the source archives. You know, stuff that's not happened to be up at UC Santa Barbara. And I've been, for the last 50 years, I've, I've been, you know, doing a book, a movie, the teachings, reproducing stuff. So I've been, I haven't stepped outside of it. I've been living it. And he hasn't disconnected himself from me. I mean, we mind speak all the time. And, you know, it might be strange for some people. Maybe my language might be strange, but I don't know how else to explain it. And it's not like I'm stuck in the past or I live in the past. I, I've just brought the past with me, and I have a very full life in the now. I have a daughter and a granddaughter that are, are, are living on my property. And, um, you know, I, 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 I'm, I don't know what to say. You know, Saturna, my daughter, was the last baby born in the family before it dispersed. Well, let's let's kind of just, I mean, I know that you said it's hard to explain, but kind of describe to us how you know that, that, it's, that it's him that you're talking to and not just part of you being represented as him. It would be the same thing. So okay. it doesn't matter. And, and I know it's him because I do believe in other dimensions, and I do believe the veil is thin, and I do believe um, that that is absolutely possible. Many people have talked about it for hundreds of years, you know, whether having visions or, have, or being told something. And I always question it. I, I I protect myself with if this is not of the light, if this is not of the good, if this is not, you know, of of the truth, then I you know I block it. I will not permit it. I will not allow it. So you know, you, you have things that you can say to make it very clear that you're not allowing anything but but the truth. And uh, on and something on a spiritual level, and I have questioned it, but it's always been the best advice. It's never been anything that I found fault with or harm with, or hasn't been of the good. So whether it's him or not, whether it's a guardian angel, uh, whatever, um, it's always been for the betterment. So I trust it. And just certain little things happen that come through as a sense of humor that only he would have had. 
There's little traits that happen along the way before I get a thought, and it's right in tune. So, so do you, has he given you any indication about how he feels about um, how it ended for him on this plane? Is he is is he at peace with what happened? He. From what I have gathered intuitively, not necessarily a direct communication about it mm-hmm. to that extent, is he got a, definitely got a passing grade in this incarnation. He did good, but there's always better, and there's always more to do. And whether he he decides to do it here, he told us he was going to back to the home planet. His home planet is Sirius, and for I would say a good six months in morning meditation, he would get visions, and he would he would share them to us, uh, you know, from his visits to Sirius. And he said, Sirius is the sun behind this sun, and he would tell us, and he and he was. He would always get very excited because people would come to him and he would say, I'm going back home. I'm going to my home planet. So whether he went back there or whether he decided to incarnate here because he has such a great love for America, I don't know. I don't know. I don't think I want to know. I don't want to get hung up in that. Sure. You know, if he came back, I would not want to know where he was because that's not my that's not part of my program this program that part we Uh, did what we were supposed to do and i will see him again and we will work together again and uh it'll be what it's going to be but in the meantime you know i like to keep things as clear as possible so let's just talk a little bit about that about then sirius being his home planet his home you know where he comes from are, you're talking about this. I would assume he he was talking about, uh, you know, where his soul originated, for lack of a better term. Right, at the, his planet, and and it's it's being brought forth that there's confeders, confederacies of different planets. I think once aliens and we're aliens, you know, to a degree too. Um, I think once. I, I think we are going to see the Confederacy. Con, I think we're going to see the different societies somehow of different planets. They say that's happening on Mars and the Moon now. So, you know, I don't know. So, I mean. <clears throat> So it wouldn't it wouldn't be fair then to say that he considered himself to be, you know, f- from another planet. Then I mean, he was an Earthling, and he was, you know, this incarnation. He was an Earthling. We're all Earthlings, but we that many of us believe we're also star beings. We're we're, we're star seeded. We are from other planets. That's not uh, that. Even the Bible says that you know the fallen angels or or. There's graffiti on all the cave walls of, like, spacemen and rockets and people in helmets and, you know, other beings. Where did they come from? And they come from the sky. And and there's this whole belief system that we have been visited. We've been seeded right from the beginning by by extraterrestrials or aliens. And, but we've morphed into where we are now as humans. So who knows? I don't know. I'm just trying to keep it all together with my part of being here in this incarnation and and allowing everybody else their part in theories. But I'm totally open to it. Well, I think we will take our final break here. Uh, When we come back on the other side, I want to get into kind of the aftermath in terms of the, the family of what happened afterwards. Uh, and, and we can talk some more too about the, you know, the, the getting all of this information out there and the, the kind of the legacy of the Soros family as well. I want to also remind everybody too, uh, of course, tomorrow night I'll have my spooky South coast program airing right here on midnight FM. 
Uh, and I know that there has been some complaints from people about the sound quality of that show broadcasting over Midnight FM. And I have to be honest with you, I've been working with the engineer at WBSM to try to figure that out, and we can't figure out what it is that's causing that. The audio that comes out of the board uh, is beautiful audio. If you're listening on a pair of headphones, for some reason when it goes into the mixer that I need to use to stream the audio, something happens and I can't fix any of the settings. So if it's a problem, if you have an issue with it, I would recommend you can go on the paranormal radio app during the program and you can switch to the spooky South coast stream, uh, which comes direct from WBSM's app, or uh, it would be even better if you downloaded the WBSM app and listened to us that way as well. And I'm going to continue working with the engineer to try to figure out what that problem is. But I just want to remind everybody that does tune in and listen, the WBSM stream is beautiful. It sounds just as good as, you know, the, the, the usual midnight FM stream, if not better. So I would recommend trying that if the audio is an issue for you. Uh, but that program will be happening tomorrow night at 10 p.m. Eastern. And then on Sunday... We will announce our lineup of programs for next week here on Midnight Society. We put that out on our social media channels on uh, both Facebook and Twitter. You can find us there at Midnight D-O-T-F-M. And welcome back. Our final segment of tonight's edition of Midnight Society here on Midnight FM. And we are talking with Isis Aquarian about the Source family and about Father Yod. And we were talking before uh, about his passing and... I wanted to uh, I wanted to ask just going back to to that incident and and, and what happened that 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 led to that. Uh, so he had never gone hang gliding before, right? He had no experience doing this, right? And you said I, I don't want to gloss over kind of what you had said, but you said it was a windy day. But when he took off from the cliff, the wind had stopped. It, as soon as he stepped off the cliff, the wind completely stopped stand still that's true and so it seems like you know what he was what he was feeling and what he was thinking was kind of leading up to that moment i would almost think that he probably had a moment of you know expectation and acceptance in that moment i don't know i i'm at a point where i'm there's only a certain thing i can't there's certain things i can't talk for him Sure. Yeah, he, he, you would have to go to him and ask him, <laughs> you know, how do I, how would I answer that? Well, I don't know. But, but I, uh, well, one thing that, that I, I think maybe you, you can at least offer some insight on then is even though I know that he must have been in, you know, a great deal of pain from that, do you feel that it was a peaceful transition for him? Yes. I think it was a, a long uh, it, it was something long in coming. I think it's something that he had wanted to figure out for a long time, how to pass. Uh, he talked about samadhi a lot, like how the yogis would just sit and will themselves to die. The American Indians would say it's a good day to die. They would go out in, in the woods and just leave their body. You know, there, this is something that's in many cultures and tradition. Uh, the monks can do it. You can sit and will yourself to die, and your organs will start to shut down. You don't eat or drink. In fact, if you don't eat or drink, you will. Anybody can pass within two weeks. It's. I don't think it's a um, uh, uh, a memorable experience. I think it's somewhat painful. But um, he talked about being. He was ready. He was ready to. To go home to another planet, he was he, he was ready to end this incarnation. He really felt that he had done everything that he either needed to do or wanted to do. His whole life, he had a an mo that followed him. He would leave every situation and everything when it served its purpose and got to a certain point where there was no more for him at that that juncture he had to go on go somewhere else figure something else out and it was the same with us he you know he 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 wanted to go but he didn't know how he could because he, you know he knew he couldn't take his own life so, so, so I, I don't know it, it happened it, and and we did not know about it it was it was just a much of 
a shock to us and news to us that morning when he said, I'm, I'm, I'm going hang gliding, <laughs> and walked out the door and didn't even give us a chance to, to say anything. Because when he moved, if you at lightning speed, if you didn't move with him, you got left behind. So all we knew is we needed to just get in the car, the vans that were going, if if we even wanted to figure it out. So, but it sounds to me then, you know, and and again, I'm an outsider looking in here and just and hearing your recounting of it, but it does sound like he really did fully believe that he had given you all the tools that you needed to go on on your own yes. and that he, yeah, he, he wouldn't have, he wouldn't have gone if he didn't if he didn't feel that way exactly exactly if if there was still a purpose or a reason for him to be here uh yeah he would have stayed and he did he stayed he overstayed as far as he was concerned cuz i like i said he started this process uh, right before we left LA, and he tried. He tried many times, and it is you know we we had such hooks into him. We were not going to let him go. <laughs> we were so not ready. Well, you know. N- now let me ask you though, with the ability of 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 all these years of hindsight. Do you think that you were ready and that it was more just the emotional attachment and, and that maybe he had prepared you as best he could, but you just, you know, the, it was the person that you didn't want to lose necessarily exactly. needing the teacher. Yeah. When, when, when you find somebody that's on a soul level and you, and most of us living together with each other and him had never experienced the depth of a soul relationship that was so pure, we weren't ever going to leave that. Why would anybody leave that? It was like the highest thing that we had found up to that point, and it was working for us. It was amazing. It was great. Why would we ever give that up or leave it? Most of us thought we were going to live our whole life like that. He was the one that, that was done. We weren't done. We were never done. We would have never been done. But that's that's more the that's more the attachment than it is, you know. Whatever whatever it was, uh, finding somebody again, you know that that feeling of finally finding each other again, and uh, whether it was uh, you know spiritual attachment, atta- whatever label you want to put on it, I don't care. I'm not even going to question it. All I know is we would have never given that up. We would have never have left ever. And, and, and maybe this just seems like, like that's his, his final lesson is that I yeah. know that that's the case, but it shouldn't be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. So I'm just going to show you. Well, or it could be that way. Why couldn't it be that way? That's the way it's supposed to be. That's the way the Aquarian age is supposed to be. That's the age of Aquarius where we can find soul partners where we can find soul groupings where we can find being together community villages whatever and be at peace with each other be at one with each other be happy with each other be working with each other what we had is the way it's supposed to be so then did everybody makes, no it, it, it makes total sense but then i wonder yeah. then what was the feeling in the mindset of everybody i mean obviously there's the initial you know the grief and the feeling and the sense of loss, of course. But as time passed after that and, and people started to heal a little bit from that part of it, uh, was there a feeling of that you you were in the position that he thought that you were in? Or was there a feeling of, you know, that you know maybe you're not going to be able to live in that age because you've lost somebody that, that brought you so close to it? Well, okay, Tim, it took us, first of all, there was a certain amount of shock that happened with everybody, the shock syndrome. And I do believe for a very long time after we had a form of, is it PST, post-traumatic stress syndrome? Yeah, uh, yeah, PTSD, yep. Yeah. And a lot of people just locked it away and ignored it and went on. And in like 20 years, 
we had our first reunion 20 years after he left the body. And that was, that, that, when we all got together, it started, we started addressing things. And the breakdown started happening. And then the, then the having to go back and, and finally look at it, talk about it, address it. And it was very gnarly. We've had three family reunions, and it's, we are just, it's been almost 50 years, Tim. And I would say within the last five years, we all have just finally get, gotten to a point where we can be okay with it and each other because we finally realized that everybody had their own opinion. They had their own way of seeing it. They had their own way of dealing with it. Everybody went on to do different things. Not everybody, you know, um, people had the opportunity and safely to question it. People left and they just shut it off. Who are they going to talk to? Who are they going to talk about? Right. about you know, uh, especially when the word cult started being put on, on on communes, it's like nobody wanted to be known as being mind, mind uh, what's that word? Uh, brainwashed? Brainwashed and in a cult not being okay and having to explain it when you, you hadn't even explained it to yourself and worked it out and went, what just happened, you know? So... Um, that's yeah. That's that. <laughs> well, so you know, a couple of other things have happened. I want to bring up since this is going by so quick. I I thought, God, how am I going to do three hours? I need another three. <laughs> <laughs> I would say time has flown by here tonight. Jeez, we got to do another one. Um, you know, we did have um, HBO was on board. We even signed contracts to do an HBO series on this. But we declined it. We walked away from it because they wanted to take it and completely do. I mean, they were going to just so ruin the whole thing. They, they wanted to, to to really do some stupid stupid stuff with it, and I wasn't going to allow the disrespect. And and so we walked away from it. But the you know I'm. Thank you. Thank you for these these three hours as we're getting through it for maybe somebody else to 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 get a different thought about it because it wasn't just us. We have, everybody thought we were the that they were the only ones. We didn't find out until like maybe twenty five years ago through a, a, a historian called Tim Miller that did did an essay uh, uh, for his college. There was thousands of groups like us. They weren't. We weren't all the same. We all are, were different. But there were so many communes and so many crash pads and so many people living off the grid in the 60s and 70s, and nobody knew about the other one. We're just finding out about each other because of social media. And that was a shock. There was tens and thousands of groups like us doing different things. But basically, with all the same, the, the 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 same learning process, and so I thought that was very interesting. And, yeah, and that must be huge to realize that it wasn't, you know, an, an individualized, uh, you know. No, it, it wasn't. It wasn't an anomaly to be part of this. That it was there was an entire movement going on. It might not have been the same movement, but there was definitely, you know, for lack of a better term, something in the air that was pushing yes. people to being better. And, uh, yeah, that is exactly right. And, you know, I'm, I'm, if you don't mind, um, we are getting ready. My next project is a coffee table photo book I'm doing with my two partners, Charlie uh, Kitching and, and Jody Willie. And that's going to be done through um, Sacred Bones out in New York City. That'll be out next summer. But I don't know how to tell anybody where to go to find out this stuff. I, I, I am on Facebook, but, you know, you can Google or YouTube Father Yo, the Source Family, or our band, Yahoo 13, Y-A-H-O-W-H-A 13, and there is so much out there on us. All our music, our teachings, interviews, uh, it's just kind of like mind-blowing. Well, I mean, we'll, I, 
I was going to say, we'll definitely help. I think help. you can still get our book. The book's out of print. We're getting ready to maybe do another printing on it. But I think, um, you know, Amazon and Google, they, they, I think you can still find some of the stuff. It's called the Source Family Documentary. It was put out by uh, Drag City Records out of Chicago. And then I've done things called No More Secrets, which has all of our family teachings and wisdom. And I think Amazon still has that. We even had a comic book done on us by a Blue Water Comics wow. um, Father Yod comic book. But our, but our book, which won awards, by the way, is, you know, Father Yo Yehoah 13 and the Source Family. I think you can still find copies of it somewhere. Well, and, and certainly keep us up to date with the coffee table book because, you know, we'd love to have you come back when that comes out and, and we can talk more about that. Uh, but you know that you're right there's there's not enough stories that are the good stories of of families like yours you know we always hear the 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 salacious stuff you know we always hear about the cults we never hear about the ones that actually made a difference in people's (laughs) lives and gave them what they were looking for that's why we dropped hbo that's the word that i wanted to use but i thought i'd better not they wanted to just salacify it and i'm like why there's so much that happened. You didn't even tw- you didn't need to tweak anything. <laughs> you know, we were so off the chart to begin with. Why would you want to try to make up stuff? And and everybody kept comparing us to the Manson to the Charles Manson family, and um, kept wanting to bring him into to everything we ever tried to do and. It got interesting. It got interesting. I mean, I'm just going to look at this from a, a surface level perspective. And, I, you know, I probably haven't looked into into the Source family as much as I probably looked into the Manson family. But it's completely, exactly. it's completely different <laughs> situations. You're, you're talking about I somebody know. who manipulated weak-willed individuals and also, you know, kept them stoned out of their minds on drugs as compared to somebody who gave the actual spiritual enlightenment that people were looking for. It's two, two completely different things. I know, but... Also, how many murders did yeah. you guys go out and commit? Probably not any, right? You know? like Father Yod? Yeah, no, he did. He killed two people. Well, let's... Do, well, as Jim Baker, but right. they were all both in self-defense. But, I mean, he, he used his judo. His hands actually... And he did go to jail on one of them for five months and got out, but his... Hands had to be registered as lethal weapons. I mean, there's stories within stories that you just, your jaw is just going to go, you've got to be making this stuff up. You know, it's like, no, I'm not. Well, I mean, I, I didn't, I didn't want to bring that up because it is pre Father Yod. But I mean, I mean, do you want to yeah, share the details I went, of that? I, I said nothing. Nothing's off the table. Well, so I, you know, if you can share what happened, it is in those what in- it is. It is what it is. If you, if you can tell us what happened in those instances. Well, the, um, one of them was, had something to do with a pit bull, a dog, a neighbor's dog or something. And, and, and you know, when neighbors start fighting about something over the fence and it escalates, I think he got into an altercation with the, with the neighbor. And it has something to do with a dog or a pit bull. I'm not, I'm not real clear on that one at this point, but he, yeah. Uh, judo ended up being used for in self defense. I, I guess the, the guy came at him with a dog or something. And I think uh, uh, this is all kind of like you could Google it and pull up articles. I know there's an LA article on when his second time was when he had, um, he was. He was, I think he was still with the, the Aware in his first restaurant. And he was having an affair with one, an actress named Jean somebody. I can't remember her name at this point. But uh, her ex-husband found out and got totally ballistic and confronted Jim at the restaurant one day and said that he was going to kill him. And he and he walked out, and then a couple hours later he came back, and I and um, 
I can't rem- I don't want to say it wrong because I think I don't know if he had a gun or what happened. Anyhow, Jim also had to do a judo blow to take him down because he was coming at him. And uh, but what he did do, which I don't even understand, was not only did he do a judo blow on him, but then he shot him. So I think that's what got him in trouble was that it was kind of like a, a, a why did you have to do both type of thing. Right. But like I said, you know, that was something he's only he can answer. I can't answer. That was Jim Baker. I wasn't there. And um, that was that. So, But, I mean, again, this is, this like you said, this is pre, you know, Father Yo, this is his previous life, so... It's not like you I know, know but many people still saw him as Jim Baker, and he even you know there was a point where he he said, "You know, I'm not Jim Baker anymore. I'm really not." And that was one of the problems with with one of his women he was with at the time at the beginning. She was Robin, and he was Jim, and they were together, and she couldn't let go of the Jim Robin part when he morphed into Father Yod, and he was no longer Jim Baker. He didn't want to have anything to do with Jim Baker. He was going somewhere else, and he was somebody else. And she couldn't quite make that leap, and he had to leave her. You know, he had to just go on. And, um, you know, to this day, for her, it's still Robin and Jim. He's still Jim to her. So and and how did it happen? I mean, you know, I know that this is kind of some mundane things compared to the bigger, you know, spiritual questions and, and answers we've gotten to. But when he did pass, you know, there was this money that you said that that the that the family had, and I know that you said it had been, kind of been waning at that point. But still, how does that work when you've got you know previous family that are probably looking for? you know, whatever piece they can get out of it, yet everything has been in a communal nature. I'm sure that that was a a legal nightmare. Well, no, because we we had tried to keep the family together for two years, and we were struggling because people weren't really working. And so the money dwindled fastly, but we did use it to keep the family together. And it wasn't really a lot of the money left. There was still money owed to us from the Swiss restaurant actually quite a bit of money. But when people left, they didn't question that. They didn't care. They left. They didn't even question the source money or the the source restaurant. Nobody asked for anything. Everybody just left. And it got tied up in not doing uh, back taxes, I think. It became a legal nightmare that nobody could untangle. For somebody to go in after a couple years and and try to deal with it would have cost them more than what the money was there, and it, we just all let it go. Yeah. No, nobody took anything. And and you said all, you said it was two years that you tried that. to you keep the tried to keep the family together for two years. Yeah. Did somebody step in in, in a leadership role, or was it everybody yes. kind of banding together? Yes. Uh, uh, Makushla stepped in. She didn't want to. Makushla was no drama. She was a very quiet person. Uh, you know, she, she certainly didn't want to be leading the family. But there was really nobody else that anybody could agree upon or that anybody wanted to do. You know, the, the, the Council of Women, his wives, were still together as a council. So we kind of, like, came in as a council to try to keep it together. But it just, like I said, everybody came in because of him. They didn't come in because of Bakushla. They didn't come in because of the council. They didn't come in because of each other. It was, you know, slowly realized that it was, it was done. It was over. And, and, and when people started to go and separate and go their own ways, uh, did anybody try to, you know, pick up the mantle and, and, and maybe start their own groups or, or start to teach what they learned to That's other people? That's a good question. Uh, people act, there were people that went in groups, five, six people, uh, or, or their little, like, groups that they had, or, 
or somebody would go and get a house and make it a household and other people would come in and they would try to make that work, but none of them ever really panned out. I mean, they never, none of them ever really lasted long as staying together. It, it, it Finally, everybody just finally gave up and said, okay, yeah, we're all supposed to go out and do our thing. And a lot of people just went back home. A lot of people went back to doing what they were doing or or setting up new businesses or, you know, we had some amazing people in the family that were, were amazing before they came in. You know, we had musicians. We had um, business people. You know, we had people that had businesses who were used to doing business and or people, there was, we had people that came from wealthy families. You know, we had uh, Atla, her, her uncle was Mayor Tom Brady of uh, Los Angeles at the time. Lovely Previn was Andre Previn's daughter. She was one of Yehoah's wives. And a lot of people just, you know, got taken care of and absorbed back in to, to, to their family and, and went from there. And, and and how about yourself? You know, where did where did your journey take you after everybody dissipated? Um, I left with one of the with one of the brothers of the family who I had uh, had a, at that point a six week old baby with, and so we left and and tried to keep it together for a couple years, and that that you know ended up not working also. And I actually, my parents gave me, my, my mom and my younger sister gave me an offer I could not refuse. And they said, you come back home and we'll, we'll get you a house. And here I had a, a, a young child and um, I said, okay. <laughs> and I went back to Oregon and, and, and for a very short amount of time and then knew that that wasn't really what working for me and I came back to Hawaii and kind of been here ever since. And are you, you know, associated with anybody from the family still now? I yes. Mean, oh yeah, we all are. We call it the coconut wireless. We all, whether we like each other or still working out stuff with each other or whatever, uh, we, we have a link and when something happens somehow, it gets around and everybody knows about it if they need to. When somebody has a baby, if somebody passes over, if we have a reunion, you know. And, and we're at a point now where we're really all kind of actually looking forward to coming back together again. And, you know, with COVID and everything, we're waiting for that to, sure. to get to a point to where maybe we can all get back together again because now we're all really excited about it because we are all have matured enough and worked out enough to let it all just go and really come back right with each other and, you know, respect the process that, that we went through and happened and wish each other well and end this incarnation on a good note because we all want to get a passing grade too. I mean, I'm not going to, I won't sugarcoat it, your family story, the Soros family story, sounds like a lot of family stories where, you know, the, the yep. patriarch or the matriarch passes away and the family kind of splinters. But then exactly. over time, they, they start to realize, OK, let's, you know, let's put aside whatever the problems are and come back together. Yep. It, we, we've heard it with our own families and in our own lives. So it's not surprising that it's the same with yours. Well, I had to do that when I went back to my 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 family, my birth family, you know. Because I got, <laughs> yeah, we all did. We all had to go back and sit down and figure it out and make amends. And a lot of I'm sorry's happened. And there was, you know, a great deal of time between the end of, you know, everybody kind of being together as the Source family. And then when you started uh, telling this story, uh, you know, with, with the book and, and, and then, of course, with the documentary, in that ensuing time, do you feel like there was a lot of misconceptions about the Source family? Do you think it was forgotten? In I mean, yep. how do you think it was looked upon in those years? It wasn't known. It wasn't known at all. Our music was out there, and nobody knew who it was or how to get in touch with us or where it came from. 
the music became famous and iconic before anybody even knew who did the music or who we were or how to get in touch with anybody. And then with social media and stuff, and some of us start, you know, having accounts like Facebook and stuff. And that's how the publisher of the book found me. And she said, I, I, I got this, this music and nobody knew who it was. And, and then I, I found out it was the first family and we didn't know who the first family was. And then I found you and. <laughs> And then it just took off from there. Gee, that's the, that's the documentary HBO. I mean, that's the angle right there. I you know. Don't, you don't need to I make know, them a exactly. I, if we ever were to do to do one, that's exactly right. It just would have to be done like that exactly. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I, but, I don't, you know, who knows? I don't even care. I don't even. I don't know. I I'm done. I did. I I did what I was supposed to do, and. <laughs> I, I'm done, <laughs> but things keep coming up. God, who knew I was going to do the photo coffee table book, and who knew I was going to be doing a three-hour interview with you? And, <laughs> well, and I, I think, just when I think it's done, it's not. I, I think you're going to find though that the story will. It, it's only going to pick up steam because we've got people now that are searching for something, and so a story of people well, who yeah. searched and found will will definitely resonate. Well, we definitely have historical and cultural relevance, and it's iconic. It's it's really iconic at this point. And, um, yeah. Well, I, so, I, I want to thank you for joining us and spending three hours with us. It, it flew by. And uh, and, I, and I hope that you will keep us up to date with the coffee table book and we can have you come on, even if it's just briefly to, to let us know, you know, when it does come out and, and give us all the details of it. Yeah, Jody and I and Charlie will come on. That'd be great. No, I will be. Believe me, Jody's amazing. Yeah. Well, we will. She's actually, I wanted her to come on this one, but she couldn't do it because she had a project. But she can put a different spin on things from somebody outside of the family that's amazing to listen to because she got to know all of us now. Well, we are booking that. That is uh consider that on the calendar for whenever we can make it. I happen. will. Got it. All right. Well, <laughs> thank you again. Thank and, you, Jim. And have a wonderful rest. I mean, I guess it's still pretty early where you are, right? It's not, it's not as late as it is here eight on the East coast. Yeah. Eight, so. eight o'clock. Well, enjoy the rest of your evening and your weekend. And, and thank you so much for the time tonight. All right, we'll stay in touch. Absolutely. Take care. All right, bye. That is Isis Aquarian. And again, you can find her book. It is out there. I didn't put a link up because I couldn't find one uh, that I thought you could grab it from. But keep checking all the different bookseller sites and everything, and you'll find one. But the documentary film uh, is there for you to watch free of charge at midnight.fm. Uh, so you can click on that. I know when you click on it, you know, it looks like you're signing up for a streaming service, but you're not. It's a free streaming service called Pluto TV that will allow you to view it. And I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight and all week long. Uh, we will be back next week with, again, you know, shortened shows, but we'll still have a fresh show for you each and every night uh, because that's what we do here. We want to make sure that we are giving you entertaining and informative discussions like this. I mean, if you had told me, I didn't even know about the Source family, and if you had told me, you know, just the wealth of information and, uh, and experiences and, and just how interesting that was, I never would have had any ideas. So that's why we do this program is so that we can learn about things that we didn't know about, or we can take things that we do know about and look at them from different perspectives. So that will do it for tonight. 